as we close out this Pride Month, it also closes out on a note of sadness. A couple of days ago, the Evangelical Covenant Church, uh, an evangelical denomination, voted to defrock my friend and colleague Dan Collison and kick out, kick his church, First Covenant Church, out of the denomination because of their full embrace of LGBTQ people in every part of the life of his church. It was very sad to watch my friend go through that rejection by a denomination he spent his life and career in. Last week, some of you may have seen it at the Twin Cities Pride Festival, a group of people stood at the entrance of the park with signs declaring that God considers LGBTQ people unclean and profane. Every year they come, I see them every year, they post biblical texts, taken out of their original context, by the way. They post these texts on signs to indicate some kind of rejection of God's LGBTQ people. And every time I see them, I find myself sad, of course, but I also find myself surprised, still surprised, at their lack of imagination. <laughs> I, 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 I just cannot believe that people are just so limited in what they can envision. And that's dangerous because God shows out. Let me put it this way. If you think you got God figured out, I'm going to avoid you. Because you, 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 you don't seem to understand who God is. God is not limited like that. And so I am surprised at their lack of imagination and their obvious anxiety about the possibility that God just may love people you hate. I figured that out a long time ago. I don't care how much I dislike somebody. I'm sorry, I, I can't get in the way of God loving the very people I got a problem with. By the way, it's the, it's, the, it's the nature of following God. I haven't figured God out yet. And I don't think God is going to allow me to. And so, those two incidents, the, the, the throwing out of a church that has the imagination and the love to accept their, their LGBTQ people, and people with anti-gay signs coming to a pride festival, highlight how often it's lost on church folk. We're not talking about the mean folk, but how it's lost on church folk that God's faithfulness cannot be contained within the structures we have created to organize our faith. God cannot be contained like that. And, and, and the apostle Peter received a powerful lesson in the futility of trying to contain God within the limits of his faith. Now, you can't get more faithful than Peter. Peter been there from day one. Peter's been with Jesus from the beginning. And he would have to learn that you cannot contain God within the limits of your faith. No matter how faithful you are, you cannot contain God. Peter could not fathom that God would reveal God's self to those who did not follow the traditions and practices and requirements of his faith. He assumed that a Gentile, a non-Jew, who had not fully taken on the physical markers and the ritual practices of Judaism could not be a part of the way of Christ. He just knew it, it couldn't happen. And then there was Cornelius, a centurion, a, a Gentile, a man of power. This man has a lot of power. Who may just have even regularly attended the synagogue to worship God. Obviously someone seeking to be closer to the God and saw in the, in the practices of Judaism that, you know, God is saying something. God is reaching out. And so, but he could not even fathom 
that God would call him to a deeper participation in the church. You see, Cornelius did not keep the legal requirements that Peter kept. He did not do the things that, that Peter did. And so he did not presume that he could be a part of the faith in the way that Peter is. But God deemed Cornelius worthy and called him to be a part of the church. So here you have two people with different callings and experiences of God. One who assumes that his expression of faith and his relationship with God are the only ways that God reveals God's self. And the other who assumes that the way he connects with God is bounded and limited by the way the synagogue is organized. But God is not interested in the distinctions. God reveals God's self to both of them. To Peter, who had always been there, God reveals God's self. To Cornelius, the non-Jew, the centurion, the man of extreme power, God reveals God's self to him too. And so to the powerful centurion, God says, I have heard your prayers, brother. I'd see you. I've seen your faithfulness. Now go meet the apostle. And then to Apostle Peter, who was full of the Spirit, Acts says it all the time, Peter was full of the Spirit. Peter, who was there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on all flesh and empowered him to bear witness to God through Jesus Christ. God reveals God's self to Peter in a vision of animals and creatures that Peter called profane and unclean and refused to even consider as food. Now I want you to see something because I, I, I don't think you get it. I want to make it powerful for you. The very things that Peter hated, the very things that Peter said are not good, that are unclean and defiled, the very things that things he should have nothing to do with, he sees a vision from God of them coming from God. Oh, you didn't even hear it. I'm sorry. The very thing, Peter, let me put it this way. If Peter had a sign and said, these snakes and birds and all the other things, you are evil and unclean and we can't be anywhere near you. The very thing he had on his sign at the Pride Festival, God said, I'm sending it to you. I told you, you cannot predict what God's going to do. God is out of control. God doesn't play that way. So everything that Peter said is unclean and defiled, God sends it down from heaven. Oh, but Peter, was, Peter, Peter couldn't understand. He, what? What is this? God's response was, what God has made clean. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. And even as Peter contemplates what God has just shown him, and I know it must have upended his world, he encounters Cornelius. God brings together two of God's own that the church says should not come together. Two who should not have anything to do with each other. God brings them together. One commentator called the encounter between Peter and Cornelius the revolution of the intimate. It's revolutionary because two parts of God's body are moved beyond their places, their traditions, and their stations so that, God, so that they are not, they are not abstractions or caricatures or theoretical opponents. It is intimate because God brings them face to face despite their differences to see each other, to know each other, to become church together. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. To become church together. While we got folk throwing folk out of church, God is saying, I want you to be church together. I want you to be church together. They're coming together then. It's the fullest expression of God's intent for the church. The church did not take responsibility for embracing or including the Gentiles. We can see that right there. The church wasn't at the forefront of saying, let's embrace these people unlike us. 
Let's embrace someone like, unlike us. Left his own devices. Peter might not have even opened his mind or heart to someone like Cornelius. He said so himself. He said, he said before, it is forbidden for me to eat with, visit with, or associate with someone who is unclean. And where I don't hang out with you folk. You nasty. You eat the wrong things. You do stuff I don't like. I don't hang out with you. But because Peter and Cornelius both trusted God, trusted God's revelation to each of them, they were not beholden to their traditions. They were not beholden to their prejudices. They were not beholden to their ideology about how it's supposed to work. They opened themselves to the new experience orchestrated by God and found themselves showing hospitality to one another when they said they shouldn't be doing that. And when we look at how Peter and Cornelius came together, the church was not involved at all. Uh-oh, what you say, Pastor? The church had nothing to do with it. The church, there was no convening of a church council and meeting to discern the place of Cornelius and his family in the body of Christ. God did not wait on Peter. God did not wait on the church. God made the decision. God initiated the encounter. God determines who's unclean and not clean. So stay out of our business and worship with us or leave us alone. It is not Peter who determines who's clean. It is not the church who determines who's clean. It is God who determines who's clean. The Holy Spirit falls on all flesh, not on the flesh that Peter and the church deemed appropriate. God says, I will fall on all flesh. I don't care if you like the flesh or not. Oh, I'm getting upset up in here. God declared those who are considered profane and unclean to be clean and thus worthy. This story, this story, this story is often called the conversion of Cornelius. But in reality, it is the conversion of Peter. Peter was the one who said, I don't hang out with unclean folk. And God changed Peter's heart. The same Peter who called what God created profane was transformed such that he was led to testify about well his encounter. I truly understand now. I get it, God. God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. It doesn't matter what Peter wants. It doesn't matter what the evangelical covenant church wants. It doesn't matter what a bunch of anti-gay protesters at the Pride Festival want. The gospel will be heard. The gospel will be heard. The gospel will go. The gospel will be heard by anybody, including each of us sitting here. The gospel will be heard by us when we are open to God's call. That's what we've got to remember as we continue to celebrate Pride. That's what we have to remember, that the gospel seeks us, that God keeps calling us. But you see, this story is our story. Cornelius is the forerunner of the inclusion in God's story of all those who have been rejected and cast aside. God initiated the coming together of those on the inside and those on the outside to reveal to us that God's intention is to include all God's children in the reign of God. And no rule, no practices, no traditions can be used to exclude anybody God has created. There are no distinctions that prevent God's people from being called into the body of Christ. There are no distinctions that will prevent God from revealing God's self to all God's children. And so there should be no distinctions in any church to exclude God's believers. So look around you. Look around you. God initiated this coming together as a body of Christ. This is a Holy Spirit formed gathering. No matter what anybody tells you, that's why it exists. That's why it's so persistent. That's why people can't do anything. That's why people shake their heads and wonder how could it be? Because this is a Holy Spirit formed community. God reaching out and touching each and every one of us. The gospel finding us, even when we're at our lowest, the gospel finding us and calling and beckoning us in to be church. Look 
look around. We are the fullest expression of God's intent for the church. And as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, and then we celebrate and close out this Pride Month, this story continues. This story continues. I know the story is still contested. Our very existence is still contested, especially in the church. There are still some churches and denominations holding on to the outdated homophobic and transphobic notions that God's LGBTQ people are unclean and defiled in some way. There are churches and denominations who are resisting the inclusion of God's LGBTQ people in the body of Christ, but we cannot let them dissuade us. We cannot let them interfere with the gospel moving in our lives. We can let them dissuade us from laying claim to our place and purpose in the body of Christ. Oh, I know, I know, you've, I know, pastor, you say, it's hard to lay claim to faith because our very bodies, our very experiences are sometimes discounted. It's hard to lay claim to faith when people are keep telling us on this other side that you can't have it. Some Christians tell LGBTQ people to stop being gay or you can't be a part of God's body. And then you have the non-Christians who say, I don't know why you LGBTQ people want to be with those Christians. They're too mean. And so sometimes we find ourselves caught in the middle. But you don't have to be caught. You don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be worried about it. God's gospel comes, comes to each and every one of us. I hope we see that God is determined to self-disclose to to us. That's why why at the same time that God went to, to Peter, God went to Cornelius. I just want, God just wants to be seen and heard and known and determined to let us know. I hope we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be withheld from us. No matter how hard people fight against it. That God's grace finds us wherever we are and transforms us and includes us and empowers us. The Holy Spirit indeed falls on all flesh, on all flesh, and empowers God's children to bear witness to Jesus' work and ministry. And because of God's unconditional love and unbounded grace, we are worthy we are worthy. And so, as you close out pride, I want you to walk out of this place bearing witness with your bodies, with your words, with your confidence that we have worthy lives and embodied, empowered to be God's children all over this place. And boy, are we proud. Amen.